Hi Bill, welcome to Polycon 18. Um, before we get started, can you let us know your full name, your title, and what you're best known for in the blockchain space? Sure. Uh, my name's Bill Tai. I'm a uh, venture capitalist. I don't really have a title because I uh, kind of work on my own. Okay. Um, I'm known for being the kite surfing venture capitalist. I've funded uh, a lot of companies in the space, whether it's you know Bitfury or HUD8 Mining. Uh, I'm an advisor to Power Ledger and AirSwap. Amazing. Um, and in one line, what can you say about Polymath? Um, polymath is basically applying smart contracts to automate the functions in the old world of the regulatory efforts that go into the creation and issuance of securities. Okay, and can you tell us a little bit more about how you're involved with Polymath? Yeah, Polymath obviously is uh, taking the high road in making sure that the, the things that, that come out of the systems that they're building are um, kind of registered, recognized, and, uh, and not on the dark side yeah. of um, you know, <laughs> financial trading of any kind. Yeah. And uh, I've been a venture capitalist now since 1991, so you know, 20 seven years of equity investing you don't cool enough. <laughs> <laughs> uh, makes me want to align with the forces uh, that are good and clean. And so um, I'm looking forward to continuing looking at companies and investing with Polymath. Very cool. And how do you think the token security market is going to disrupt the cryptocurrency space? Uh, well, so crypto, like uh, a lot of new ways of technology, started in kind of an organic way. If you look at um, some very uh, uh, obvious prior waves, whether they were DVDs or video, you know, kind of video recording in general, a lot of technologies find their roots initially in um, industries that people might consider the dark side, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, and I think as, uh, and that was the case with crypto. I think it, very early on, a lot of the people that were using crypto um, transacted on sites that, really that don't have a, a positive name mm -hmm. you know wh whatever they may be and i think as uh as the regulator you know as regulators start to look at the space it is just fantastic that there's somebody from inside the industry taking the high road and taking the initiative to make sure that the things that we do as a community mm -hmm. are are scrubbed and compliant with what the world wants and needs to be scalable and replicable and you know out of the gray zone and that leads us perfectly to the next question. What do you think the future of ICOs, security or utility, and why? You know, it's been interesting to see, um, you know, a as an equity investor for so long, while I was fascinated with Bitcoin and got involved in the space kind of 2009, 2010, so it's been, you know, a good eight years for me, I was always, in the beginning, a little skeptical of the ICOs mm -hmm. because I was so used to purchasing voting shares of equity in a class of stock that I understood and felt like I was getting something, that uh, the ICO seemed a little mysterious to me. You know, I felt like, wow, you know, there's an opportunity to buy something that looks a little bit like a poker chip mm -hmm. in a casino, thinking that somebody might buy that poker chip from me at mm -hmm. a higher price than I paid. Why would they do that? You know, mm -hmm. and and I couldn't quite get it. But then I started to realize, you know what, the nature of equity shares themselves is changing. So in the in the 90s. Um, a lot of stocks would trade off of a so-called PE multiple. Mature companies tend to do that. So mm -hmm. you hear the term PE all the time. And then things started to adjust in the new world of kind of, you know, network community-based businesses to, you know, price to earnings to growth rate. Mm -hmm. So the companies that had higher growth would have higher multiples. At the limit, what we're seeing now is some of the businesses, whether they're Google or Facebook or Snapchat, those now are companies that are issuing non-voting shares. Mm -hmm. So you are kind of holding, in, a, in effect, yeah. a token that may be measured off of PE, but that's not the case with Snapchat. Mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, so, so I think the world is sort of moving to a, a set of uh, kind of capital instinct connecting to communities of interest around businesses that have revenue but don't really have earnings. So there is no PE. Mm -hmm and there is no voting right. Mm -hmm. So what is that? That sounds a lot like a token yeah. to me. You know, so I think the, there's a confluence of things merging because the structure of the economy is changing. And, uh, and I think they're all gonna kind of be the same thing. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a great insight. And finally, um, how do you think securities on the blockchain um, will affect Wall Street or even finance? You know, I think it's basically um, the evolution of blockchain is just adding to the continuum 
of what's been happening to Wall Street anyway. I think uh, as you think about lots of industries that go through deregulation, they before deregulation, they, they tend to start with you know higher fixed costs and, and higher average selling price per transaction that you know covers the cost of the machine. Mm-hmm. And then as things open up, companies are driven towards efficiency. It happened in telecommunications, it's gonna happen in, in electricity generation, and Wall Street has actually been going through this step by step for decades. Mm-hmm. There was a, uh, an event that people on the street referred to as the Big Bang in the 60s, where commissions were deregulated. And there was a concept before that there were firms that were called the $2 broker, because there were commissions mm-hmm. of $2 a share uh, to trade a stock. And over a period of decades, that shrunk now to you know pennies per share, if not fractions of a penny per share. And I think what uh, what blockchain represents, it basically looks like a a TCP/IP layer for assets. And what that what I mean by that is you know the internet runs on top of something called transmission control protocol or the internet protocol TCP/IP. Mm-hmm. When you write an email and you package a bunch of words on on you know kind of one digital sheet and encapsulate it, it drops into that TCP IP transport stream and it comes out the other side. You knew where it went, when it went, who received it. You can even tell when somebody opened it if you want to. And so I think the blockchain is essentially that for a digital identifier that is tied to an asset. Mm -hmm. So I think that's uh, been the case with a Bitcoin itself, which is really just a a, a virtual piece of value with an identifier. Mm -hmm. And you could swap in and out of that really anything. So whether it's a car, you have Uber. Whether it's an apartment, you have an Airbnb. Mm -hmm. If it's a piece of paper that represented an equity share, you have a securities transaction. So I think what's going to happen is the costs are going to get wrung out of the entire system, and that will drive Wall Street to applying their energy and efforts to things that are a little bit more interesting and productive. I mean, you know, being a stockbroker, I bet that's kind of fun Mm -hmm. for a while, but I, I, I don't know what good that does for the planet, you mm-hmm. know, spinning uh, pieces of paper around. So I think as people start to get freed up to apply their time and energy to things that are, are more interesting, yep. you know, I think, uh, I think the world would be a better place. Perfect. Well, it's been absolutely pleasure.